So, Beto, I watched recently a documentary on Discovery called Why We Hate. Yeah. And I asked you to watch it so we could talk about it on the podcast. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda, and I grow organic coconuts. So the reason why I want to talk about this documentary, or I don't even know what you'd call it, I guess a documentary, is because it involves a lot of things that we talk about on this podcast. Politics, um, why we hate, yeah, um, tribalism, mm -hmm. conflict. Colombia. Colombia. And I thought that this uh, was an important show that I'm glad they made. But there's some critiques that we might say about it. So sure. let's let's get into it. Let's do it. So I'm surprised that Discovery even made this because I have I've associated Discovery with crap uh, reality TV. Oh yeah, you know what do they usually do? Well, back Are in those, the yeah. back in the day, it was space and science, you know, okay. and yeah, well, right, and right, right, nature, and yeah. you know, Shark Week and stuff. Right. And now it's like reality tv really well the one thing i've realized while watching this you know on demand is that all the commercials are for other discovery shows mm -hmm. and they're all reality tv shows uh. and, and from what i can tell they all take place in alaska <laughs> in like the in the in the wilderness but anyway so i'm surprised that they made this and they also said this is season one which makes it seem like wait so there's gonna be right. more, more seasons maybe although yeah it did say season one but i wonder if that's just like like just their nomenclature system. It's like even if you don't have a second season. <laughs> but usually, like if it's a if it's a mini series, they sure. won't say season one. But who knows? Producers Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. who is known for being interested in projects like this, yeah. anti hate, this kind of thing. I think it's a big reason why he made um, Schindler's List, and he also made right. the movie about the boat with the slaves on it. Right. Uh, and, um, Amistad, didn't Amistad, he, didn't he and, make that? Uh, the, the one about the Olympics, that, yeah. that uh, Jewish team that goes to try to get vengeance from the Olympics. Right, exactly. And also by Alex Gibney, who has, he's probably the most uh, well-respected, most award-winning documentarian of all time. Really? Oh, yeah. He made oh. Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. Oh, I like that one. You remember that one? Yeah. He made The Going Clear about Scientology. Oh, I like that one. And many others. Oh, uh, I like those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been criticized for being muddled, um, you know, kind of random. It doesn't emphasize power structures enough, which we'll get right. into later. Uh, but I definitely applaud the effort for sure. sure for sure. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to criticize this, you have to recognize that 99.999% of what's on television is not trying to right. do anything about major things that are impacting all of our lives, yeah, life like what, and death situations. What are we comparing it to here? Right. Like, you know, <laughs> to two men and a baby or, or <laughs> half, two and a half men or whatever that show is. I will say, you know, like the, the only thing for me was that it's called Why We Hate. And there was a bit of that, but a lot of it was examples of hate, right? And which is fine. Like, obviously they were trying to show all the different kind of uh, social problems and examples of them and things like that. Uh, but I, I, I sort of wanted a ton more science, you know. Well, I actually... Not that there is a ton more, but... Right. <laughs> I actually appreciated that balance because we don't know why we do anything. Sure. So to present the science, plus to present what we do know about the brain would be so technical and boring and also like pretty in its infancy regarding our understanding. Sure. It's just, I guess, you know, call it, you know, a look at hate or something. <laughs> well, I think it did provide some explanations, in which we'll get into. With the, I, I cataloged the various explanations as, as that they presented um, in the show, which uh, we can get into. Uh, someone wrote a review that I thought, uh, you know, said it well. Why We Hate is a vital show. If, if it only had the courage to consider the most effective form of conflict resolution might be justice. In other words, the show doesn't emphasize the fact that there are, uh, you know, there's structures of power and that when those structures of power uh, 
act in ways that are uh, not unjust, then you have conflict. Do you yep. know what I mean? It, it sort of implies that's, that's that's kind of my point. Is that like there were a lot of there's a lot of reasons why people start developing group hatred. That's not just about you know sports identity or city identity or even political identity. It like you're saying, a lot of times it is just we have nothing to lose here because we are like nearly destitute, you know, or, or we are being. Um, mistreated on a daily basis by the cops or, you know, right. and so forth. Yeah. Although it definitely talks about groups that are being oppressed and marginalized right. and and doesn't paint them as like uh, having equal uh, cause in the conflict. But it doesn't emphasize enough that we have a history of racism and sexism and right. uh, power and money and who has the better guns and these kinds of things. And when you are an oppressed class, you're going to fight back. Right. And it's not just because you saw the white people, you know, Native Americans trying to fight back for their land. Yeah. It wasn't it, as if the Native American, the reasons for the hate were not the same for the Native Americans right. as it was for the white exactly. people. You know? And it's like, why do some people hate Harvey Weinstein? It's not just because he's a different political party. <laughs> yeah, which is another point yeah. that you're bringing up, which is that sometimes, quote unquote, hate or tribalism or conflict or uh, fighting in some very, you know, firm ways is totally justified. Right. So, but anyway. But still. But still, I applaud the effort. I, I, I wonder if they made that choice to not include those things because they didn't want to scare people away. Could be. They didn't want to create con uh, controversy. They wanted this to be for everyone. For everyone. Yeah. And actually, I think that was a good choice to make. Um, having said that, I wonder how many conservatives actually sat through the whole thing because hmm. it seemed to target conservatives. You know, it do, it's not very kind to Trump. You know, the way they treated yeah, Trump in, in the show... They didn't treat like Hillary or Obama in the same way. Right. The way they treated Trump supporters, they did not treat Democrats in the same way. It's hard to find Obama an Obama clip where it's clear clear that he hates some group. But it's not hard to find a Democrat in t the past ten years doing something unreasonable. The, a Democrat in general, true. Uh, the, the Obama or or Clinton would be hard. Um, you know. Cert certainly Trump has, you know, pretty overt, over the top tribalism, just classic yeah. um, tribalism and racist whipping, yeah. whipping up people. But uh, so I just w but but I wonder if conservative because the a big part of this, I think the hope of this show is that it can it's it, it can help all of us understand this these concepts so that we can make our society better. And if it is unappealing or pushes pe half of the country away, I just wonder if they should have adjusted that a little bit. Having said that, if they had, would all Democrats have, would everyone have walked away <laughs> because be. of the way that this was Could be. <laughs> uh, you know, presented? So the main points of the show is that I think that they're, they're trying to inspire people to question their tribal affiliations and their assumptions about the enemy and their following of charismatic fear mongers, yeah. which I think is a, is a good, you know, effort. And I think that they did a good job of it. Yeah. It, you know, the part of it that really I thought was effective, because, you know, from the outset, we should probably say there's nothing in this documentary that you and I haven't heard of or read about or, sure. or talked about sure. or known about already. Uh, yeah, and uh, although I mean there were there were a couple of things you probably knew a little more about uh, res the research or whatever, but uh, and like for example, I actually didn't know about that pr the the effort to do those videos in Colombia. That was that was interesting. Oh, I guess I didn't either. Yeah, uh, but but I was gonna say that. But in terms of the the concept, yeah, the concept, and and something that's been true, and and I I was realizing this as I was watching it because remember how I've talked before about how I never liked clicks. Or like scenes, you know, how I've, I've said I didn't like scenes. I never knew why, you know, it's just like if you ask me, well, are you into grunge or are you, uh, what were the straight edge people in, in high school? Or 
I never liked that concept, but I didn't know why. And if you'd asked me, I would have said, I just don't like it. It just feels clicky or whatever. But then I started thinking about it. And one thing that just gave me such a bad taste in my mouth and my stomach and my brain growing up in Bogota and Colombia when I did was in fact the tribalism. Because I would see everyone obsessed with the soccer game. And, you know, oh, the Millonarios defeat Santa Fe. Whoa. And it was such an obsession. Even in spite of all the crap that was going on, everyone was like, oh. You're saying Santa Fe, Colombia? Yeah. Oh. And then I would see. So they stole it from America. Uh, yes. <laughs> and then I'd see like the sort of tribalism around beauty pageants or about all sorts of competitions. And then I'd see the tribalism in politics, of course. And I think that was probably what really made me dislike that whole thing. And so... Well, I was thinking, I thought you might ha say the political groups that were actually killing each other and traumatizing you and putting bullets through your house would be the thing that would turn you off against clicks, not the soccer teams. Well, no, but, but it, it was all symptoms of the, same, of the same problem because, like, essentially... Uh, Everyone was so focused on theirs, you know, my family, me, those that I'm with, everyone else can be fucked. And you saw that anger. And I saw that in reality with bullets, like you're saying, and in massacres and stuff, and in the quote unquote trivial trivialities of daily life to the point where I think just over time, I, I just got so grossed out about it that in general, anytime a scene would be in front of me, I'd be like, ugh. Uh, you know, it's like yeah. this visceral, visceral reaction against it. Yeah, I get it. So I'm kind of worried that the people, as I was watching the show, I was like, oh, this is great. But I was worried that what people would do as they were watching it would be, oh my God, look at all those stupid tribal people. Mm -hmm. yeah, look at those neo-Nazis and their stupid thing. Right. You know, look at those, you know, people in the Huntus in Somalia uh, is it Somalia? Was that where it was? Or? I don't know where the Huntus are from. <laughs> but, but you know, they did a little clip right. on that in Africa. I should know that. Um, they uh, Look at those stupid groups. Why did they do that? It's yeah. so dumb. Why did the Nazis? It's so dumb. And not look at the self because we all are doing it. Right. In extremely destructive ways, more so, I think, and in the United States, as time progresses. So I, I wonder, you know, the average American, and I guess anyone around the world watching this, I just wonder how many of them are going like, huh, I really need to look at what I'm doing in a really honest, tough way. I, I, I would disagree with the as time progresses part, but I would say that, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that permeates our society um, for sure. Well, I'm, a, I'm referring to the increased echo chambers and the increased partisanship in the United States and, and how yeah, it has yeah. gotten worse recently. Yeah, maybe. It's always been around for maybe. sure. Maybe. It's just it's like... It's not like people... It's not like conservatives and liberals didn't hate each other, you know, yeah. 40 years ago, but... but and there the, was a civil war at one point, and there was, exactly, you know... Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and there were, there were uh, bombs, uh, many terror... You know, domestic yeah. terrorist bombs in the 70s many domestic yeah. terrorist bombs in the 20s and right. 30s. So I think so, it's probably true that within a pocket of white America, there wasn't as much subdivision for a while. And then the divisions might have been more like racial. And now the divisions are more complex because you'll have, yeah. you know, the majority, ethnic majority of the country definitely still divided. Yeah, I guess... And it's just my anecdotal gauge on things. But when I was a kid, I remember hearing my parents and other adults talk about politics. And I remember there was this vibe around like, well, you know, maybe I'll vote for the Republican president. Maybe uh -huh. I'll vote for the Democrat. I'll, I'm, a, a lot of the people in my circle were open to the uh, were just sort of like, let's see what happens. Yeah. I, I don't I'm not. I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I'm right. an American, you know, and I, I just, I'm just, and that's why Reagan won with the landslide, yeah. which I don't think it ever happened in the United States today. Right. You it, know? Could, it could be that there, there could be sort of a, a local phenomenon in the last, say, I don't know, 50 years or something where, where there was at the beginning of this segment, some sort of evening out of the party so that yes, they had different ideas, 
but they were all sort of playing for the same end goals. And I think maybe lately people's impressions are that, no, 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 we're not even playing for the same end goals. And maybe that's causing extra division between, or, or almost uh, extra non-crossing of the lines possible well, kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that it's the nature of our media and the internet and social media, and I know it's you know a, just a common thing to say, yeah. but I think it's quite real, it's quite measurable that in the past, uh, my parents, for example, they sat down and watched the same news that everyone else watched. Right. They read the same paper that everyone else read. There was no liberal paper, there was no conservative. Some papers leaned in certain directions. Yeah. But you had the Seattle Times and the Seattle PI, and one was a little bit more conservative than the other, but they presented basically the same information. And some editorials. Yeah. Some editorials, that, you know, but you know, 60 Minutes had the same people. You right. know, you, you had- And, and there wasn't a 60 Minutes on one channel while you know, 120 Minutes was on the other channel. Right, exactly. <laughs> So the uh, difference now is that the average American, when it comes to anything political, they only receive from their uh, party, so to speak. They only get partisan information and they never hear from the other side. And when they do, anyway, so it's a, it's a known phenomenon. And I think that I don't, it's, I'm not a genius for saying this, that it's, it's causing people to be... Uh, to, it's causing the two tribes of the liberals and the conservatives to one uh, not understand each other very well, to build up to to build up uh, false ideas about the other group, and three to further the conflict and to four further the the reason to back away because like say for instance Fox News you know it's a conservative organization right mm -hmm. well. And I'm guessing in the past, I might have been able to actually watch that and not cringe. Sure. But today, it's almost impossible for me to watch it and not just be like, it's painful to sit through, like Hannity and these kinds of people. Sure. So I, I, there's just a lot of, you know, you know, one I'm thing not, that, I'm, you know obviously, uh, this has been said a billion times before. I'm not saying anything new. But one thing that's odd about the media thing is because um, I, I listen to. Uh, a lot of progressive sources, and I also hear a lot of uh, right-wing sources, uh, they both demonize what they call the mainstream media, meaning I hear almost the same exact talking points yeah. from the progressives than from the right-wing. Yeah. The right-wing says, oh, the mainstream media, all they do is lies, fake news, trying to, everything, right? And and the the progressives, they it's slightly different, but it, it's sort of still saying essentially you can't trust the mainstream media, but they'll say, oh, they have to call everything 50-50, everything down the middle, they never poke holes at the establishment, and they only support establishment candidates, blah, 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 blah. And so both of them are telling me, you can't trust MSNBC, you can't trust CNN, because they're, all, they, you know, for whatever their reason is. And then meanwhile, the people telling me this are also quote unquote news outlets and i'm like well okay you guys are full of shit <laughs> well or there's nuance there of just like um if you're on the progressive side you just be like so i'm going to present my spin on this and i hope that it convinces you what right. you're going to hear from mainstream media is this and this and this and here's here's my critique of that but you know they make some good points uh, Fox News will say this and this and this, and you know, there's pros and cons to what they say. I understand why they're saying it, and I agree with this. I mean, how right, often? No one's doing that, <laughs> right? How often do you hear yeah. a partisan uh, speaker say, "Oh, Trump said something I agreed with today"? Well, some some do, but it's rare. Absolutely, I, I've never heard it. Well, so on the Young Turks, Jan Guger does it all the time. Okay, he but but to be fair. He's one of the guys railing against the quote unquote mainstream media. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think he's also, you know, literally called Trump a Nazi. So, um, but I could be wrong on that. Anyway, the other thing I'm worried about, so I'm, I'm worried about people will walk away from this, uh, this um, documentary saying, oh my God, look at all those stupid people. You know, I'm not like that. Meanwhile, yes, you are. Uh, the other th worry I have is that people will walk away from this documentary especially the first couple episodes, terrified that we're all going to get killed by some kind of 
neo-Nazi group or something, you know, oh, sure. uh, causing more fear and thus more tribalism. The other thing I'm worried about is that the show at the end, the, the final episode is called Hope. Yeah. And I was like, oh, great. They're going to go into like hope and what we can do to change. And they kind of do, but they kind of don't. And maybe they're setting up future seasons, which Could I be. would appreciate. But the the call to action in the final episode was was not clear. No, it was not clear. In fact, it was more of, here's some things some people are doing, FYI. But it, one, like, one of them was not something you can just like emulate. It was like, hey, look at what ended up happening with apartheid. Right. Okay. And then the other one, though, I, like I said, I really liked the Columbia one because that was like, oh, that's interesting, which we could have imagined, right? You try to show, give some uh, examples of real people and their real lives to the other side right. and get them to see them in an empathetic way. You could imagine that could have a positive impact. In fact, one could imagine a documentary or a show that would focus more on that might have a positive impact. Right. And they did some of that, and right? Of that. Like the Westboro church woman and yeah. the ex jihadist and the ex uh, skinhead. Um, but and, oh, we're, but at the end of the episode, I'm actually going to go over what I recommend for government and what I recommend for other people. And I'm going to talk about what I do along those lines. So let's, I just want to briefly go over what's good. Before getting to the main points that the show presents, is going over those, I just want to talk about some good and bad things that I wrote down here, here in my notes. Um, oh, I thought that it made some, I wanted to say earlier, that the real compelling part of this, so there's nothing in this documentary that was new to me. It, I, I think about this all the time. I read this right. sort of stuff, all it's basic social psychology stuff. But the part that was new to me was the juxtaposition of these images. So especially in the first episode when, which by the way, do not watch this if you are skittish. In fact, if you're a normal human being, yeah. you want to turn away from the screen. Warning, times. warning, warning. Yeah. Like I'm not even going to say it's for sensitive people. I'm not a sensitive person. And I had to look away from the yeah, screen. It was hard. The first the, it's throughout the series, but particularly the first couple of episodes, and they do not warn you. It just goes boom, and these, you know, basically they show all the worst live link, you know, yeah. reality beatdowns and death of people yeah. that you could imagine. But I thought that it was a it was a compelling image to see those, and you know, like everyone's seen a YouTube video yeah. of, you know, three uh, or like. Um, a political fight, like in sure. Charlottesville, you have the neo Nazis and you have the liberals and or right, the right. normal people, I should say, because even re, you know Republicans aren't going to go along with some of that stuff. Uh, right. And there is violence. You know, there's a the people are screaming at each other. Yeah. And people have their iPhones out and they're filming it. Right. And, and someone might get punched. And then someone gets punched. Yeah. And then and you know and the the loud angry faces and they juxtapose it with the chimps. Right. And and then they go back to that, you know, they just, they do that side right. by side. And it was like, holy crap. And other, other primates. Right. And you're just like, oh my God, it is exactly the fucking same. And of course yeah. it is. But seeing that juxtaposition yeah. really drove it home to me right. that we are fucking animals. Well, and also not the fact in a bad way. We're just animals. <laughs> and, al and also the fact that we are the kind of animal that, that came out of, uh, fight for resources, you know, and tribalism, like uh, and, a, and, like a snake will fight another snake. Right. But but the difference about our species and other species like us, other primates, particularly, we develop tribes, and our tribe right. attacks other tribes. And and but but like yeah, and what, what I mean about the resources is be like the example they gave about bonobos, right? Which is yeah. that in. In animal societies where, um, you know, for whatever reason, resources are, are more plentiful, uh, they don't need to spend those points, those evolution points on, on developing strategies for supremacy. <laughs> you know, and yeah. in our case, it was like, hey, you better beat the other tribe because they're going to beat you and take all your resources. Right. And I thought that in terms of providing science, that was 
a great point to emphasize. There, I can't imagine all the stuff that these documentarians had to sift through in terms of sure. like, well, what do we say? And because sure. they just did one episode about right. you know the origins of the the our evolutionary origins of the conflict. oranges, <laughs> and uh, they brought up a big, a great point in. Um, and the, you, you notice they didn't call themselves evolutionary psychologists. They no. call themselves evolutionary anthropologists, anthropologists yeah. and there were other names because everyone tries, or I don't know, but I find a lot of people like to distance themselves from evolutionary psychology because it has a lot of bad connotations. Evolutionary anthropology has, has no bad press about right. it as far as we know. Anyway, so what they present here is that chimpanzees and bonobos came from, and us all came from similar ancestors. And the reason why the bonobos and the chimpanzees uh, speciated was because of this river that, that um, you know, it was not easy sep to cross. <laughs> separated the two. And on one side of the river, resources, food, was uh, not abundant. Right. And on the other side of the river, resources were abundant. And so when the resources were not abundant, then it served an evolutionary purpose for the species to develop not only a culture and a practice, but also uh, uh, psychological mechanisms, if you will, that are more aggressive, right. more fearful, more suspicious of outsiders, more resource hoarding, uh, more male oriented, because male uh, in these species have a greater, you know, aggression instinct, shall we say? That's the idea. It's hard to measure. Bonobos, with their abundant resources, didn't have to fight with right. fellow tribes. A fellow tribe could could sort of invade your space a little bit, and you'd be like, "Well, I don't know. We have we have a shit ton of food here. So what's yeah. the what's the diff? It doesn't make. Who cares that this other tribe came over? It doesn't make any difference to us, really. Yeah. So. Uh, so no need to fight and thus no need to uh, evolve certain mechanisms and also no need to privilege men, uh, the boys, be the males, because uh, we don't necessarily need the, the, the stronger of the species to right. physically stronger to <clears throat> be in charge. We can allow the females to be in charge, the ones who are doing more nurturing and more sharing and this kind of thing. And the social structures and the culture, if you will, the learned behaviors that are passed down through the generations became different as well. The, so they brought that, which I thought brought up good points in terms of, uh, for us, that when, and they didn't really draw this super clear, but the idea is, is that for us, since we came from that, it's likely that when we perceive that our resources are low and threatened, that we become chimps like. Yep. And that when we have when we perceive that we have adequate resources, then we become more bonobo-like. Absolutely. Um, so, so very apropos right now, there is a a, pro a set of problems happening in Colombia. Um, there are massive demonstrations happening. They're leading to violence, and it's 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 gotten really really bad. Um, and there's a lot of friends and family that I know that are, uh, you know, on the one hand, rightfully complaining about the violence and the destruction uh, because no one likes to see that, you know, vandalism and all these things. Uh, but, but the difficult part is that you don't get, the vandalism doesn't arise out of nowhere. Y you have protests for a reason. And when those protests happen, the, there's segments of tho those protesters that are more disenfranchised, more antisocial, more this, more that. And then inevitably, or unfortunately, inevitably, uh, some violence happens. And the, you know, one question is like, well, but why don't we see like these protests in, I don't know, Malibu or in, in some rich neighborhood in Switzerland or something like that, you know, and in general, is, is it because they're genetically better, less hateful people? Right. Or is it just because they have more resources to go around right. so they don't have to pull each other's hair out as much? Right. Uh, another example is African-Americans in Seattle are not treated great. African-Americans in uh, Missouri and Alabama are also not treated great. It's a treated yeah. great. It's a different sort of totally different world for African-Americans in those two contexts. But when you live in a community where there's a lot of resources to go around and 
then you're less likely to feel the need to do anything. You know, mm -hmm. like the the not that, but it's not to say that they shouldn't do anything. Right. Like right, African Americans right. <laughs> in Seattle should stand up right. and say something, and they do right. often. Uh, but when your entire community has been, uh, and and there's like. A better point. I don't know if I'm making the best. Point. No, no, you, you, I, I get but, what you're saying. But like a recess, a re yeah. a, 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 a recession in the economy, for example. Right. So the same racism can be happening in a community, but for whatever reason, that community goes through a recession. Right. You're going to see more violence. You're going to see more speaking up. You know, because absolutely. And you're going to see more racism. And you're going to see more more unintended violence or, or, you know, whatever, outcrops of violence as a result. Right. So, anyway. Uh, and, 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 I mean, look, look at and the example of the big uh, crash in 2008. You know, the, these banks basically bankrupted the world, ruined who knows how many millions of people, right? And yet the, the as bad as it got was like the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? Which is just like not that bad in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, and the reason is because in this country, we're so freaking lucky yeah. that the worst among us are like, eh, kind of doing okay. Right. All the, and there was a common criticism was all the Wall you know, the, the 99 percenters had cell phones right. and food on their backs and designer clothes and laptops and a home to go right, to. Right, right. And, yeah, and whereas in another context, uh, if you don't have that, then yeah, it's yeah. You just less to lose. Um, so as I was watching it, I there was never, almost never a time where, and I thought there would be, where I was like, oh God, that was dumb. Like there wasn't a moment mm -hmm. like that. Right. Because it's a discovery, you know, I just had low expectations, <laughs> but there was never a point, you know, it wasn't ch as cheesy as I thought it would be. It was well done. Yeah. And, and you're right. There weren't moments where you're like, oh, that's dumb. Yeah. And watching the first episode with all the quote unquote science brought up. The whole time I was like, oh, God, get the notebook out now. <laughs> There's going to be a bunch of bullshit in this episode. Sure. And there really wasn't. Yeah. So I thought it, you know, it, it was good. I also thought that the documentary rides the line well between what you're calling science or evolutionary psychology, you know, brain science. Mm -hmm. It rides that line, but also with society uh, well enough anyway, because it, it doesn't really propose you know, certain answers. Like another show would say, there's a part of the brain that, you know, has been found to be responsible for why we hate. You know, it never does that. And a lot of these kinds of discovery channel, history channel documentaries will make such stupid claims. I also really like that they interviewed real people. And it did, it did make the claim about the political affiliation, uh, having a brain correlation i don't remember that what they yeah, say they, they basically said that um i forget which one was the dude that like uh you know research proves that you know uh certain the more fearful you are the more conservative they you didn't are. specifically say that but that some some uh pre-wired parts of your brain will determine genetically they said genetically you're they, they drew this diagram they said what part are you going to be on is, is determined by an, a variety of factors. Part And like 50% they drew a line. It was like 50% was genetic. And then I'm sure they didn't mean it to be exact. And then some part was where you were raised and all in your know, family and all these kind of things. But they made the point of like, yeah, your brain determines a lot of what kind of party you're going to be in. Yeah. You know I mean, certainly the brain plays a role in, say, disposition and uh, certain... Uh, innate sort of tendencies in the brain could play a role, but we we are in no position to answer that question uh, with our current science um, at all. Plus, uh, if there if I'm understanding what I forget that part, but if I'm understanding what they were saying through what you're saying, it, you, for example, you take a bunch of people and you measure them in an MRI and you find certain things yeah. that are different. And then you're, and then you ask them, are you Republican or Democrat? And you find that uh, on average, people who are Republicans have this, you know, acti activity in the brain that's different from Democrats. Yeah. And the the thing, the question, the the conclusion you could come to is like, oh, these people's brains are different. Well, another conclusion you can come to is because they're Republican and they're in an sure. echo chamber, their their fear centers are more activated because they're sure. fed more fearful imagery. Sure. Um, anyway. 
Uh, bad things about the documentary, again, extremely, extremely graphic, especially in the beginning. I mean, just, just yeah. like it, I don't, I, actually, I don't recommend anyone watch this just outright. I, I recommend, like, I don't think it's actually good for anyone's brain to see the kind of images right. that they throw at you in the first episode. Um, doesn't emphasize the, the system enough. Like when they're talking about mass killings, you know, like Elliot Roger and these right. people, but they don't, they very quickly mention a couple things that ref reference this, but not enough. They don't, they don't point to the fact that the vast majority of these, uh, atrocities happen in the United States. Right. 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 So it's like, uh, the, the, why we hate thing. Yeah can't just be the general right. uh, tribalism or susceptibility to information. It has to, you know, they, this, yeah. this one woman throws in, you know, and you give the guy a gun kind of a thing. But uh, it, it, was, it was similar to, because, um, you know, when, when, when they talk about Nazis, uh, they make the point, which, you know, definitely heard it made before, uh, sort of egregiously by Jordan Peterson in some ways, but uh, that... Uh, the meta point is like, hey, you know, anyone could go down this road, unfortunately. Uh, but one, one, and then they did show the imagery like, oh, look at all the propaganda about like Jews being like animals and dehumanizing and all that stuff. Makes total sense. But like they, they didn't touch on why was the German public even primed for going down a path of hating any group? Because the reality wasn't since we know that for a fact the Jews weren't in fact causing all these grievances, why were they primed for anything in the first place? It's like, oh, well, they had lost the war. There was all this actual, uh, you know, economic problems happening. And, and so like they capitalized on the, the tribalism, but because there were other issues underneath as well. Right. And that's similar to a lot of these situations. Right. Uh, like and one could argue that the allies didn't help because of their approach to Germany, you know, try, yeah. trying to get back at them instead of trying to help them rebuild, you know. Uh, that's another great point is the, uh, uh, you know, of course, we, we now think of ourselves as, not that I fought in the war, but I'm saying like the allies were the good guys and the Axis were the bad guys. Clearly, these mass murderers were bad guys. But what's interesting is a lot of the propaganda being used to foment our side was like this horrible racist propaganda against the Japanese, right? And that was, you know, some some military scientist going like, well, you know, if we dehumanize them, it'll help uh, the soldiers kill them. Right. Well, that has a lasting effect. <laughs> right. Exactly. That it doesn't, it definitely didn't point towards those decisions that were made. Another one, just getting back to Nazi Germany, is we think of it as inevitable that, you know, Hitler rose to power, right. but it is not inevitable, in my opinion, and right. in a lot of people's opinions, historic historians' opinions. It could have easily gone a different way. Right. Uh, it, it didn't, it, the, the, yes, there were anti-Semitism in that society as there was in uh, around the world, mm -hmm. but it wasn't nearly as rampant as it obviously became. Yeah. So uh, that was the decision of one person or a set of people their, there was their strategy. Yeah. So the, the tribalism was created in a context that it could grow from, uh, from a small a group of people who had power. And, and they didn't really go into that. The, the other thing that uh, they didn't go into was they didn't emphasize uh, these, these, yeah, basically I was just in my notes just talking about that. They also go into Pol Pot, which I found was interesting. A whole section on yeah. Cambodian Pol Pot, which... Uh, I'm glad for the awareness because a lot of right. people don't understand that there was this just massive atrocity, yeah. in, in, you know, that had to that was on the scale of of the Holocaust. And, and by the way, I, I actually didn't know the the that in history I, I knew about the site Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat, whatever. But I didn't realize that oh, they were this like very powerful like kingdom uh, in you know the mid thousands or whatever. And so I didn't have that background. I didn't know that. Because when they showed the pictures, I don't think I'd ever seen pictures or video of Pol Pot or that I remember. So I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, on the surface, this guy seems like a, uh, he loves his people. He seems like a really nice guy. He's going to bring back their glory. It seems really appetizing on the surface. 
yeah. for, from, you know, like just those uh, little clips. Make Cambodia great again was yeah. literally what he was trying to do. Um, so I was just kind of weirded out that they were even going into it that detailed because I, I don't know if it's very relevant to average Americans, aside from the broad strokes. Although, again, again I'm glad for the awareness. Also, they didn't critique Milgram's electroshock experiment very well. You know, they, do you remember when yeah. they did that? Yeah. They were basically saying like, when authority tells you to do something that sort of plays a role in mm -hmm. why we hate and tribalism. But to bring up that experiment at all is actually problematic because half of the, uh, the people who went through that, ex the participants knew it was fake because if you, have you ever seen the actual, yeah, I've seen the, it's they, pretty obvious it's fake. They showed it to us in uh, some psychology class in yeah. college. It's so obvious it's fake. I mean, I could have done a better job acting <laughs> that I was being electrocuted. I mean, it, you know, they press the button and the... Uh, oh! That's better. Stop it, please! No, that's better. <laughs> the guy's like, ow, it hurts. <laughs> and it's like, Jesus, like, give it, you know. Anyway, so uh, half the people knew it wasn't real. And the other half, most of them actually didn't go, th wouldn't obey. Wouldn't do it, yeah. So the experiment actually proves that most people won't obey authority when you when it challenges their own moral compass. Right. But everyone considers the Milgram experiment to prove the opposite, which is really right. silly. Well, now, like, now, could it happen with some people? For sure. But, but right. the overarching you know, uh, conclusion is not correct. Like one common thing, again, I, so this is something that I completely disagree with, with, with that Jordan Peterson brings up is that this notion that, look, any one of us could have been one of the soldiers in Dachau, in in one of those uh, camps. We could have been one of those German soldiers. Any one of us. Uh, the idea being that you know you you don't realize the dark side inside of yourself and how easily you're manipulated and stuff. It's like, well, hold on. A, a lot of the soldiers, especially by that point had been groomed from little kids into Hitler's youth and brainwashed all the way through, number one. Right. Number two, we're not talking about at like the start of the conflict. We're talking about when you've tripled, quadrupled down on, on the effort and on the war. And so like by then, the investment mentally is so beyond anything we can, right. any of us can relate to. And with that in mind, that it's not like if tomorrow... Nazi Germany suddenly showed up and asked me to, uh, you know, kill point blank a bunch of Jewish prisoners. Um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't do it. I right. know I wouldn't do it. Let's just put it that way. I've never been in that situation. But it, but given what you're saying, if we consider that, we could say that it is true that given enough context and enough prep and enough baby steps towards a particular immoral behavior all of us are capable of quote unquote capable right. of doing that right so no and i guess that's it sorry and maybe i'm mischaracterizing because from that perspective yes it's sort of like we have no evidence against the notion that if you quote unquote program someone from the right point in their life onward that you wouldn't be able to do this or that uh but the the main point of contention being that what is the takeaway? The takeaway should be no more than, yes, if you make sure that you brainwash people enough, they'll probably do a lot of horrible stuff. Not that all of us are half Nazi soldiers. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you'll hear people say stuff like that. Like right. we all have an inner darkness. Yeah. And it's, I actually don't believe that. Right. I mean, it's a full philosophical question, but... I actually believe we're all capable of dark things. Again, if if we're if the, yeah. if our context takes us down a certain road, for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Anyway, I also thought that they gave evolutionary psychology a little bit of a simplistic take. You know, they uh, we they they laid out the bonobos and the chimpanzees thing. I thought pretty well, but I could see people walking away thinking like, oh, we evolved to be like chimpanzees or something like sure. that. And we just have no idea. You know, yeah. th 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 one of the greatest things about the chimps, I'm so glad that evolution present as, presents us with these two, our closest cousins, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees. And we're not just kind of close to them. We are, we're as close to them as they are to each other. 
Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you when you look at chimps and bonobos, you can't tell the difference. Right. Well, aliens from outer space, when they would when they would see the three of us in a room, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference either. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, <laughs> the way we look, you know what yeah. I mean, but our genes anyway. Anyway, so certainly they would categorize it in the same bucket. Yeah, <laughs> oh, those those three species yeah. are in the same bucket. One of them's a teeny bit more advanced than the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So the uh, the thing that people might walk away from is just like, oh, there's this clear science showing. Uh, our evolutionary roots or something. The thing is, we have no idea. Right. We, we, you know, we might be like chimps. We might be like bonobos. We might be like something else, but there's no way for us to tell. Sure. So let's take a break and we get back. Let's go into the points that this thing made. What do you say? Let's do it. Umberto, if a... Um, Jesus Christ, what do, what do I say? Uh, okay, let's say, so if, if someone very interested in tribalism, trying to whip okay, up their tribe, yes. so just a general <laughs> tribal person was trying to whip up the tribe of psychology and Seattleites, the deserving listeners, into doing something, what would they sound like? All right, you pisters out there. Are we going to let the non-pisters win this are we going to let them take over, or are you going to become a true piss patron? The only true kind of patron there is, period, end of piss story. Yeah, <laughs> end of piss story. <laughs> um, okay, so the points that they go into here, we've already gone over, I'm just looking at my notes here. So the biggest thing is tribalism, which I thought was a good thing to go into. Uh, let's see, echo chambers... Um, Echo chamber. Yeah, let's see. I thought it was actually kind of interesting that they went into that mass killer, the uh, the guy who killed a bunch of black people in a church, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they talked about, you know, what his life was like, and he certainly did not come across as a sophisticated fella. No. And he talks about how he, and he seems like he's being honest because he's just laying it all out there for the investigators, the interviewers, the police officers. And he had heard like, eh, blacks are raping hundreds of women every day. Well, before that, he kept hearing about Trayvon Martin. Oh, he, right. Yeah. He, he's like, I kept hearing about this Trayvon Martin thing and I, yeah. I just wanted to know what it was. So I Googled it. And because of the echo chamber and because certain websites are paying to have their uh, st stuff uh, more likely to be shown mm -hmm. on a Google search, he found propaganda uh, for um, you know anti-white, anti-black people that looked legit to him because yeah. he's not sophisticated enough to really understand that it was it was lies, right. so it was white supremacist stuff, and it, he went down a rabbit hole. And before long, he was he was completely convinced. Yeah. You know, you just imagine someone with an IQ of eighty who can't really you know think critically very easily uneducated isolated they go down a certain rabbit hole in the internet i mean end of story end of story it's just like well there's only one answer to this there if, is if, a flat earth if i'm going to believe what because just read some of the stuff that these white supremacists will say for yeah. example you know one of the only conclusions you make is like well okay if the jewish people and the blacks and the liberals are trying to kill us all yeah they're trying to uh make all our babies gay yeah they're trying to eliminate us they've done all of these things it's that white are, genocide they've right? done all these things now to the average uh republican who is say white supremacist leaning <laughs> yeah they're going to be like, well, yeah, but, you know, it's not it's not like actual genocide. But, yeah, I mean, metaphorically, they're yeah. trying to eliminate our culture. I get that. But they're not going to believe actual genocide. Yeah. But if you can't think straight and you can't, right. you know, it's hard for you. You're not the sharpest tack in the box. Then you're going to be like, well, then we got to kill them. Are some tacks sharper than others in the <laughs> tack box? <Is> that... <laughs> well, maybe you're not sharp enough to know. So this... And and I, I thought that the 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 person the expert they were interviewing laid it out again. It's not it's not rocket science, but I thought it was laid out pretty well. She said, "You go on the internet, you search for the weather. It's correct information." Yeah, right. You this is a good point. <laughs> you, you go on the internet, you search for Bitcoin price. Right. 
Uh, this is my point. Uh, correct information. You go on the internet, you search for the birthday of George Washington. Yeah. It's correct. You go on Google and you search black on white crime and you get droves and droves of incorrect information, propaganda, bullshit. Yeah. So it's but from the same tool. And so, yeah. but it stands to reason that people would mistake the internet as being correct. Right. So, Berto, should Google do something about that? Well, it's tough, right? Because um, simple facts are, you know, are trivial. <laughs> but hard questions, I mean, maybe couching it in a different way. Like, like ima you could imagine sort of like a result being, well, I could see people still fighting this. But you can imagine some results being labeled in such a way like, hey, this is sort of a checkable fact or something and here's all the the links or whatever where there's other results being like these are just links that relate to your words you know mm. and like like visually one is like oh okay that's the weather and here's the links to why that weather is correct okay right. this is just opinion <laughs> but if you're a website yeah. i'm just gonna play i would kind of like what you're saying but yeah. i'm play devil's advocate you're a website that's been labeled questionable you could sue google and say like fuck you and you'd be less likely to pay for ads on google because you know sure. and google might lose business to bing or yahoo or what alta vista because certain people are like <laughs> I, I don't like the way that this <laughs> Uh, Google labels the things sure. that I consider to be factual. I mean, who are they to say? Right, right, right. And, and does Google want a team of people to scour the internet? You know, I mean, the 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 people hours involved. Yeah, you, in that. you can immediately run into issues, right? Like the Earth is a sphere. Oh my God! No, it's not a sphere. You guys are no, no, no. Well, it's an oblate we, spheroid. We landed. In, well, yeah, we landed on the moon. Oh my God! Da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, if the KKK pays for their site to be pushed, should Google refuse? If, if the KKK pays for their site that's essentially what they were talking pushed to be what oh, you, promoted promoted. Uh, right. So that's, I think that's that, what that's what they do. The KKK. I think that a lot of companies have uh, policies like Twitter and whatnot against um, hate hate stuff. You know. But what um, about mild? You know, mild hate stuff. Like a know. website that's dedicated to black on white crime. Yeah, I don't that's know not where hate speech. It's just, just reporting. Uh, it's just cherry picking data to show black on white crime. Right. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it's really hard to draw these lines for sure. It is really hard. Yeah, I mean, for example, Sasha Baron Cohen just made the point in a speech that uh, it is likely that. Uh, based on th his understanding of their policies, that a company like Facebook might have been okay with uh, the Nazi Party, you know, putting ads on their on their service uh, back in Nazi Germany, and of course his point was like that would have made them complicit in in the horrors, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's clearly some line, and we can't just use the whole like, well, you can't draw a line because it is it is hard, right? right. You have to draw a line. Uh, at the same time, if you draw the line too aggressively, then you actually potentially have a very regressive society with no open free speech. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just rough because the answer that I have, which is impossible, is you have an all knowing or at least a, let's just say the wisest person on the planet who, or a, the wisest team of people on the planet, right? go through every Google search and evaluate the first things that come up and say, nope, that needs to be like on page 10. It can, it'll be on, it'll be searchable, but no one's going to actually go there because that is not good for society. Sure. <laughs> um, that, that would be the way to do it. Um, and that that would be really hard to do, obviously. Yeah, and it's immediately fraught with problems. I mean, I would argue, I would say that I actually think the the problem is that as soon as you have the ability to pay for play, it does create a bigger discrepancy because it's, 
fair, although still problematic, but it's fair to claim like, look, our algorithm, let's say some company, we have an algorithm that looks at data and from that data, it spits out these kinds of results and we don't mess with the algorithm and no one can pay to change that algorithm, right? And here's the publicized algorithm that we're using, okay? Well, that may anger some people still, but at least you, you can't say like, well, they're hiding or secluding the data or promoting the data. They're, it's, you know, it's sort of, they're looking at an, a database and pulling out certain things that fit the criteria. But when you allow the pay for play, now it's like, like you were saying, anyone can pay to get promoted. Right. But even the algorithm, I mean, that, that's, they made the point in this documentary, Why We Hate, about the, I can't remember the country that they were talking about, but the genocides that were happening because of the way Facebook's algorithm algorithm worked right. it uh be, you know that the way that the algorithm works in general and maybe it's changing over time and for for because of these bad things is you're sitting there and let's say you're in a country with a big anti two tribes that hate each other yeah. and there there's violence going on and you're in one tribe and and you you like certain tribal things like you know, you like yeah. the the tribe's politician, and you you like on Facebook the tribe's soccer team or something. And there, yeah. there, are, Facebook instantly knows. Oh, you're in this tribe. They they know that. Right, right, right. And then the algorithm is like, well, we want to keep you on Facebook. That's that's yeah. our main goal. Right. Keep you on Facebook. Why? Because the longer you're on Facebook, the more you post, the more you depend, the more you see the ads. It just becomes this money-making machine for them. So the algorithm is how do we keep you on Facebook? Well, we found through the algorithm, we didn't know, we don't know exactly you know, how it got there, but the machine learning or whatever figured out that if we look for certain posts with these keywords, then you're more likely to stay on Facebook for right. another 10 minutes. We don't know why we could, if we looked specifically at that algorithmic uh, decision, we could be like, oh, I bet you this is why, but they don't, they just set it and forget it. Well, you're sitting there and you're, you like certain things and all of a sudden Facebook just starts feeding your feed with all this stuff that hates right. the other tribe. Um, and then you start going, huh, and you start sharing it. And then that propagates other people to be like, now they're upset and they start posting things. And now you're posting things and now you're getting riled up in your tribe. Yeah. The other tribe's getting riled up. Before long, there are things coming onto your feed like, you know what? We should probably kill these people. Yeah. We should kill the other tribe. And Facebook's algorithm figures out like, ooh. You like that. <laughs> there's, a, there's just a computer yeah. that's reading this. It's yeah. just like, oh, tag words, tag words, kill the other tribe. Right. The, the computer says, wow, when that phrase is in there, people really respond to that. So Facebook's algorithm. Although they take to, down any of that stuff, but but it doesn't matter well, because all the or milder langu- stuff still leads to that. Language along those lines. Yeah. We should get rid of them. Yeah. And that stuff, and I question whether or not Facebook knows the specific language of another country sure. well enough to, well, to flag certain things. But anyway. But even if you gave them that benefit. But even if you did. So, so then, you know, that, that just happens over. And then because of the algorithm, yeah. you now have genocide. Yeah. So what if we could make some rules around like, look, because in that case, it's clear that the point of the algorithm isn't to benefit users, right? The point of the algorithm is to benefit face that company. Okay. Right. Right. Keep you on. Now, imagine a different kind of algorithm. Hey, we're going to have this one website. Anyone can post information that they think is valid, but we're going to have an algorithm where these humans are going to edit that uh, that uh, content to try to get as close as possible to what the set of humans that are editing think is correct. And over time, those editors will be graded and weeded out if they're not good and all these kind of things. And then what you end up with is Wikipedia. And those algorithms are not intended uh, for how can we benefit Wikipedia and get more eyeballs on Wikipedia. The algorithms are there to try to make the data on Wikipedia be more useful and accurate. Right. A uh, similar example would be like, let's say I make a search engine and my point of my search engine is, I don't care how much time you spend on here. I am, I'm going to try to uh, bring you the most um, peer reviewed results by experts or whatever in a field that I can, period. You know, like, and so my algorithm is optimal. I might have mistakes and there could still be unintended consequences. 
of any of these things, right? But there is a big difference when the thing you're trying to optimize for is how can we make more money? How can we keep more of your attention on us? Right. It's unchecked capitalism. Yeah. Which uh, is the cause of literally millions of people having died in the past 10 years. Yeah. Which is, and it's American unbridled yeah. uh, capitalism yeah. that is a direct causal link to many bad things that have happened around the world. And the problem is those who are in power to put a check on that capitalism are our fucking politicians right. who are in a whole other kind of tribal mess and don't have any time to actually be wise. And we don't necessarily even elect wise people because we're trying to elect people and we'll get in, maybe we'll get into that later, but what we need is like wise people who don't care about being elected, yeah. who don't show well on TV, who don't attack the other side, who actually have say, well, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Like that's wisdom. Yep. And those are the people who are not in control and we're going to drive our fucking planet down the fucking tubes yeah. if we don't change the system, if we don't change the way we elect people. If we don't change our own voting habits, if we don't change our own understanding of like when you're watching a debate and you're like, ooh, that person really gave him a zinger. He won the fucking debate. What yeah. a dumb ass thing to say. <laughs> Tries me fucking up the wall. Like ask any American who says that person won the debate, you know, ooh, Kamala Harris, she won the debate. Yeah. Ask that person, how is that person different in terms of the way they're going to run the country in reality? Not right. on Twitter. Not in the zingers. Because they're going to do zingers on Twitter. What's the policy difference? Okay. And they might be able to say it, one out of a hundred will say one or two things that might or might not be accurate. Then ask them, how exactly does that work? But they look good on TV. Though. But the problem is, is because it's too complicated. <laughs> Politics, the actual workings of mm -hmm. like a healthcare system is too complicated for the Americans to understand, and yet we asked Americans to vote for people who make decisions <laughs> about that, and 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 those politicians are trying to please us when they shouldn't be trying to please us. They right. should be trying to make the wise choice. Have I have I told you about my my system before that I wanted to uh, write up somehow? Was the uh, uh, you don't elect you don't elect um, people based on like a campaign or something like that. Basically, the key is this. What you agree on is metrics. And you like just agree on like, here's our metrics. Our metrics might be unemployment and uh, GDP and, and a few other things. And you're gonna have to have environmental metrics and all these things. And the people in charge, it, it, they can be in charge as long as those metrics are looking good. And if the metrics are not looking good, they have to be replaced. Kind of like, like a company. <laughs> I like it. How do we decide on the metrics, but whatever. I know, it's hard. <laughs> but yeah, I like it. Um, my system, uh, similar to that would also be ridiculous because no one would ever accept it. Not that it couldn't work, but you don't, you elect people, but they can't appear on TV or in pictures. Yeah. The only thing they can do is present on paper or a website, but it's all script. Sure. There's everybody's website is the same. Yeah. No graphics. And it just says like, <laughs> how did you vote on abortion? You know, how have you voted on health care? Uh, what do you plan to do with your with your voting? What do you plan to do with your policies? Yeah. And 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 ex and and unless they give a coherent policy proposal, whoever oversees this says you're not we can't print that because it's not it's totally. not it's not real. Like to say to make America great again. That's not real. That doesn't right. make any, it's just rhetoric. So unless you have something else to say, right. uh, you know, build a wall. Okay. Well, you know, uh, make the Mexicans pay for it. No, that's not going to happen. Like the, the American people aren't smart enough to understand right. that that doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> we're not going to put that on the website. Yeah. Like uh, tell us if you just want to say build a wall. Okay. That'll be your policy. We'll put that on your website. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, no Twitter, and you're you're barred from. In fact, maybe it's not even a name. You're just candidate 015. Right, right. And like you're free to you're free to tweet, but if you say I'm 015, you are automatically disqualified. Well, and actually, imagine for it's this crazy idea. Imagine for a second. Oh, I'm gonna grab the Democrats for a second. Imagine if the Democrats for all the how many twenty or whatever want to be president. Right. Imagine if they all got together, and the idea is like, all right, look, obviously we can't all be president, but why don't we all? We're all gonna figure out. What's our platform? And amongst us, because this is hard enough to do, I, I, I can't believe we expect the American people to do it. So among us, we're going to pick maybe, um, you know, like the core 80% of our platform and our strategy. And then, you know, if, if, if there are some that disagree with some parts of it and you want to differentiate, fine. And then we'll use Kirk's method. This is not about zingers or anything. You just got to percent where you diverge from the core platform and why. And then we'll let people pick someone. And like you said, it's candidate 005. <laughs> yeah. And you can trust that you're not picking on every little fucking thing because you've already agreed on this like 80% base. You're like, oh, okay, well, I agree with that base. That all sounds well thought out yeah. by people that tried to make good decisions. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the way we do politics and the way we elect presidents in particular is the just, it's just the most absurd I mean, and we all look at it like, you know, we have smart people like uh, Rachel Maddow, uh, right. you know, talking about it and, you know, elevating the process yeah. and, and being a participant and asking the questions. And we're all believing, like, oh, yeah, this is a good system. It's not yeah. a good system. It's not a good system. I mean, at the very least, as you're, as you're pointing out, to put a fine point on what you're saying, and I don't know if this is what you're getting at, is right now we have, you know, X amount of Democratic uh, candidates who right. are trying to win the nomination for the Democratic Party, and they're attacking each other. Yeah, they're trying to win it as, I want to be president. Well, and I'm better than you, yeah. and my ideas are good, yeah. and your ideas are bad, when if <laughs> they were not in this context, 99%, they'd be agreeing with each other. You would hope so, and... Be well, they do. Right, and, and the thing is, like for me, I'm like, listen, I don't give a shit if you want to be president. Like this is part part of the other thing is there should almost be a penalty to you know like um, to yeah. to being a president you know? yeah yeah um, so you only do no. it if you really want to do it <laughs> so answers which I promised at the beginning okay so the government and there's lots of different things the government could be doing but one thing they could be doing or is and there's some effort along these lines but they could be putting more effort into policies that actually combat tribalism. For example, in Germany, they teach from the very beginning and, you know, first grade, and they, they talk about this in the documentary, they teach about the Holocaust. Mm. They take you yep. field trips to the sites of uh, the Holocaust, and they drill it in to their populace that the Holocaust was a horrible thing and that their country did this thing. Right. Now, in we as Americans, we teach our kids about slavery. We teach our kids about... Um, you know, Native American genocide. I don't know if we frame it as genocide, but I think it, you know, it's, it's getting more mm -hmm. truthful as, you know, compared to when I was a kid, for example. But I don't think it's enough. You know, I, I, clearly it's not enough. Right. Plus, I wonder how much schools are actually teaching generally about tribalism. And this always just goes back to, you know, my refrain. It's like we give 10 years of math instruction and like a week <laughs> on like emotional regulation or, yeah. or a day on emotional yeah. regulation. There, I get it, math's important, but which is more important? Right. I think emotional <laughs> regulation's more, now let's do, let's do six years of math and six years yeah. of emotional regulation. Or how, and how or about- 25 years of emotional regulation. Yes, yeah. how about a year of tribalism <laughs> yeah. sprinkled within the 12 years? Yeah. You know, a, a, a year of being skeptical of uh, charismatic people's claims yeah. you know uh, how about that but we come from this extremely old model of preparing people to be good laborers right. and what do you need good laborers to do you need them not to think for themselves right. you need them not to be critical of authority you need them to salute the flag and to salute their boss and sit in a seat and know how to do a math problem and know how to write a report and only learn the interesting parts of history that don't actually cause you to get angry. And if you have a good idea, it better be to make the plant run slightly more efficient. 
Right. <laughs> Having said that, plenty of fine teachers out there with good intentions, but they live in a system yeah. that limits them. And I know a lot of teachers out there are just like, I want to do this, and they yeah. get pushed back and from parents too. Yeah. And then one one challenge with the, uh, I, I think they touched on this. Um, it you do run this risk with if you don't present the material properly, of the youth being like, why are you telling me this? Like I didn't do anything. And then kind of resenting it, which I think is happening a bit in Germany. It seems like with with a portion of their of their youth that they're starting to be like, "Hey, all this history and stuff. We weren't the ones that did this, and so like fuck you, and and therefore we are Nazis," which is really scary to think about. Um, so it's it's almost like how do you how do you teach that history without making it sound like you're blaming the students? Yeah. And, um, you know, talented teachers, I'm sure, can pull that off. Yeah. Um, the other thing we need to do is campaign reform, and I guess just general pol- pol- you know, political reform, which, of course, is never going to happen. So why even go down that road? So I'm just going to shut up. The other thing is that the politicians need to uh, slow their role regarding partisan responses um, and also slow their role regarding non-responsive to things within their own party, Democrats included. So the, when a, like, I'm going to try to give the rest of the talk only targeting me and my people okay. because it's easy to attack the other side because I, I could go on all day, yep. but to demonstrate and to lead by example, my whole point of this whole episode is to inspire you, Umberto, Umberto. <laughs> and the listeners to not you know, goff, scoff and gaff or whatever at the other side and go, oh, those other sides with their stupid, look at yourself, change yourself. Right. It's all we can I'm do. starting with the man in the mirror. Oh, God. Uh-oh. Takes on a whole other meaning. But anyway, uh, so for example, my side, my Democrats, my liberals, my Seattleites, my pro-gay people. Yeah. I have friends who now, who are you know the most progressive liberals you'll ever find. They post all sorts of stuff on Facebook. They right. they pick it. They go on you know marches. You mm-hmm. know they're active. And we had a. An, a hopefully you know this story because okay. I'm I'm forgetting. We had a gay mayor who was accused of sexually abusing. Oh yeah, I remember a, this. A teenager. Yeah. Right. Yes. He was. A Democrat, obviously, we're right. Seattle. Of course, we're going to have a Democratic mayor. I had a lot of people, my people mm-hmm. around me, who started going, well, I don't know. Right. I, I right. mean, 16, that's not so bad. Right. Or, well, you know, it was a long time ago. It happened, <laughs> it happened 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, you know, okay. If you apply the same rule to say if Trump came out and- <laughs> 20 years ago, he yeah. was proven to have had sex with a teenager. Yeah. If you apply it the same way, then okay. But I don't think you If do. you're intellectually honest in that sense. Right. Yeah. And so my side of the aisle needs to, you know, stop that. You know, we need to apply the same rules and, and be, and we had, we can have a knee jerk reaction like, oh no, I love this gay mayor. I sure. love his policies. I love the fact that we elected a gay mayor. Um, I like the fact that, he, you know, he's out and he's gay and he's proud and then we just a great thing. So my knee jerk reaction is to defend him. But right. if, if I have a general policy that if politicians have ever raped a child, right, they're out. Especially so I so not only could I be more 100 percent with you on this, but especially when it affects other people, like in this case, he affected someone else, you know. Um, it's one thing which I still would see the point, but it's one thing if it's like, all right, he, he lied about his taxes or something. Let's say, you know, this, this one dude lied about his taxes and it's like, oh, we got to run him out of town. All right. I could see someone going like, are you kidding me, man? The other side does whatever the accusing thing is all the time and they don't run their people out of town. So if we keep running everyone out of town here, cause they like misrepresented 2000 bucks in their taxes, we're going to have no candidates or something. I could see that kind of argument. Um, I probably would still be like, no, man, we got to hold the line, right? But especially when you're like talking about affecting other human beings directly. Yeah. You know? (laughs) So me personally, what I am doing with, again, the point here is try to reduce tribalism. 
which leads to bad things. Join our group to reduce tribalism. Yeah. Is I, for me, I have to watch in particular my tribalist reactions against Republicans because of the copious amounts of propaganda that I, that I consume. SNL, Daily Show, Jimmy Kimmel, Seth Meyers, Fresh Air, uh, Colbert, uh, my Facebook feed, my family, my friends, everyone around me, you. There's so much uh, in my echo chamber. And so I personally um, have a huge tendency that I've learned probably since I was like 15 and started to become aware of you know the divisions that Republicans are laughable, they're idiots, they're rigid, they're immoral, they're self-defeating, and you know the fact that you know they're poor and they vote for anti-poor policies. They're backward, they're uneducated, they're dullers, they're racist, they're sexist. And although if you just ask me flat out, I'd be like, no, that's ridiculous. Deep down, that's how I feel. Why? Because of the propaganda that's been given to me. So I personally have, for a while now, been really trying to push back on that. And one of the things that I do is I have family members who are Republican and I love these people and they're nice and they're smart and they're careful and they're compassionate and they're good. In a lot of ways, they're better people than I am Mm -hmm. and they're Republicans. And so I like, okay, remember, you know, so-and-so is a a staunch Republican (laughs) and they're a good person. So I'm trying to humanize and Take away the straw man. It doesn't mean that the policies of the Republican are something to vote against, but it doesn't mean that we need to dehumanize and ridicule and uh, have an idea about them that is not only just false, but also just extremely destructive to my relationship with those people and also keeps me in my tribe and makes me more susceptible to the propaganda. If I give in to the propaganda and believe they're all idiots and they're all dullards and they're all you know, you know, hicks who are flying the Confederate flag and want to, you know, string up black people. If I believe that, then the politicians have me wrapped around their finger. Yeah. So, so this, this is, I think where it gets conflated and where, cause it's impossible for, for someone sensible to disagree with what you're saying, right? Like, for example, I, I grew up in, in uh, an environment where, <clears throat> um, I, half of my family was from one political affiliation and the other half was from another political affiliation. And I certainly couldn't like, I hate all my side of my family that's from the other political affiliation. This was in Colombia. But when I looked at the people in power, um, I could definitely say, oh my God, that person is corrupt. Oh my God, that person is a mafioso. Oh my God, that person is responsible for deaths. You know, I could, I could do that. I could distinguish. And I think it's similar today in that like, yeah, I mean, it's like blaming, it's I, it's like saying those stupid kids working in those sweat factories and like, why would they subject themselves to that and help these corporate, instead of blaming the corporation, right? So in my mind, it's like, yeah, absolutely. We should not blame people falling for manipulators. We should blame the manipulators. All right. Well, that's probably a good place to stop. That does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. If you want to chime in, please do. Just try to be respectful. Try to be nice. Try to be cool. uh, Protect our egos, if you will. And please take care of yourself because you deserve it.